Scripture reading is coming from Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. And it reads, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to, the, to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Happy Father's Day. And uh, good morning to all of you. We have visitors. We're, we're glad you're welcome you to the Waterbury Church of Christ. And those who are listening online, good morning to you guys. Hope you were, uh, wish you could be here with us. And so um, I've been doing a series of lessons, like it or not. And the first lesson I said, um, like it or not, you're going to die. And uh, last week I, I did a lesson, like it or not, you are not in control. And with that in mind, I'm going to spring forward to an illustration. There's a magazine called Mature Living. And, and it's where people write in articles, and they're submitted in the, in the magazine. And this grandmother wrote in this story. And she, had, she was taking care of her four-year-old granddaughter named Dawn. And Dawn somehow locked herself into the bathroom. And she was screaming, wanting to get out, couldn't get the door open. And so grandma's on one side and the four-year-old's on the other side screaming. And, and the grandmother's trying to calm her down. And she knows there's a key for the bathroom someplace in the house. But she couldn't remember where it was. And so finally she told Dawn, Dawn, look, calm down. I know there's a key. I have to go find it. Just be patient, calm down, and remember God is in there with you. And Don whispered, and he wants out too. <laughs> You're not in control. You're going to die. But you need more. You need more. And we're going to talk about like it or not. You need more today. And I'll get to it in just a moment. But, you know, sometimes people think that paradise is just you and God on an island someplace. Just you and God. But I want to tell you, you need more than God. Now, don't send me any nasty emails, <laughs> but you need more than God. And I want to tell you who said that first. God did. And in the Garden of Eden, you have Adam there, and Eve hasn't been created yet, and it's just Adam and God, right? That's how it begins. It's just Adam and God. And, and it's a perfect environment. It says that Adam was naked and not afraid. And so he's in this perfect environment where the temperature was just right. He didn't even need clothes. And it's just him and God. And he has everything he needs. He has all the food he needs. He, there's animals all around him. But God said, this is not enough. It's not enough for just me and Adam to be together. And in Genesis 2, verse 18, he says, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So God knows that you and I can survive alone, but I think God knows you, can't, you and I cannot thrive alone. We need other people. And so, like it or not, you need others. And that's, that's this point here. You need other people. And in order to illustrate that, I came across this book uh, called Tuesdays with Maury. And and I understand it, it's written by this sports writer by the name of Mitch Album, And he had a, a, a favorite professor named Maury Swartz. And he heard that Maury had Lou Gehrig's disease and was going to die. And so he started visiting him every Tuesday and just reconnecting. They had been a, a, a separated for a number of years, but he, it was his favorite teacher. He, he really respected the man, so they started meeting every Tuesday. The book is, a, is based upon that story. 
and it turned into life lessons. That you had this older man kind of mentoring the younger man. And, and there's a quote in the book I think is very powerful. Um, Maury said to Mitch, Mitch, we need people to survive. And when we are dying, we need people to survive. But in between, we need each other even more. And that is so true. I, I'm glad I'm with you guys today. I'm glad I have my wife. I'm glad I have my boys. I need people. I need people. And, and sometimes we forget how important that is. And another illustration of this back in the 1300s, there's a, an emperor by the name of Fe Frederick. And he wanted to find out uh, what language people would speak if no one spoke to them. And so the kingdom had a, a number of orphans, and so he told nurses, basically, to take care of these orphan children. But this is what I want you to do. Don't talk to them. Don't sing to them. Don't even hum to them. I want to find out in and of themselves what language they would speak if no one talked to them. After a year, all the babies died. And it wasn't because they weren't cared for. They, was, they were fed. They were cleansed. But they didn't have connection. They didn't have coddling. And so they learned back in the 13th century, we desperately need people. In order to thrive, we need one another. America is becoming more and more independent, don't you think? We, we're becoming an independent culture and where we think that we don't need others. And, and these books, Bowling Alone and so forth, are coming out. But I want to tell you, God... God realized we need people. He's already said it in Genesis 2.18. It's not good for man to be alone. But God's very nature tells me that I need people. In Genesis 1 it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Who's God talking to? No one's been created yet. And God is talking to somebody and he says, We need to make man in our image, in our likeness. He's talking to the Son. He's talking to the Holy Spirit. You see, our God that we worship has always had community. From eternity, He's had the Son and He's had the Holy Spirit. And here, before Adam is even created, God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness so that they will rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground in Genesis 127 goes on to say, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, since it's kind of Father's Day, focusing on men, I want to use a man illustration. I want to talk about basketball. And so I want to use three illustrations, three basketball players, players and, and bring out illustrations about them. Uh, Yao Ming. The man was huge. Seven foot, five inches. That's, who is that guarding him? Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant is like six, seven. He looks like a midget. And he's trying to stop Yao Ming. And Yao Ming is this massive, very athletic um, uh, basketball player. And in the paint, he was dominant. He was so big, you couldn't stop him. There's another picture I saw, and it had uh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal looking up at Yao Ming. Okay? And so you've got these massive players like Shaquille O'Neal that are looking up to Yao Ming. That's how, just how big he is, you know? And so Kobe's trying to guard this guy, you know, and in the paint you really can't stop him. And so people ask Yao Ming, he says, you know, in China, you guys in Olympics and so forth, you have some very impressive sports athletes. But you don't have many good team sports. Why is it that China doesn't have team sports? Because you have a lot of these individual athletes that are superb. And Yao Ming said, it's our one child policy. We did not grow up with brothers and sisters, and so we did not growing, grow up knowing how to get along. We did not grow up learning how to share. We did not learn how to do things as a team. He went on to say, when you do not learn how to get along with others, there's something about your character that never develops. 
And so here this man, he, he grew up in this culture where you know, a family could only have one child. Imagine what his brothers and sisters would look like, right? And so he's, he grew up in a one-child home, and he says, that has impacted me, and it impacts our culture. And he said, that's why we don't have very good team sports, is that we've learned to be individualistic. And he says, that impacts us. Have you ever heard anyone say, I'm spiritual but not religious? <laughs> I'm a, I hear it all the time. I have my neighbor tell me that when I invited her to house church. She says, well, I'm not really in organized religion. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Think about that. That's one of the most selfish things a person could say. I want God, but I don't want anybody else. Right? I, I, want, I want God to be on my island, just me and God, but I don't really need people. That's a very selfish thing, and, but it's a very American, too, that we think it's just us me and God that's all I need but that's not what I see in scripture and even whenever the Bible talks about Jesus it talks about us as a group not as individuals in Matthew chapter 1 she gave birth to a son and you'll give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins all this took place to fulfill what was what the Lord said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, Jesus understood that people needed to be saved as a group and that he came to dwell among us to do that. We even have it in our mission statement as a church. He says, uh, our mission statement is the Waterbury Church exists to teach and grow followers of Jesus through love, worship, community and service that we think it's important for us to be together like this that we need one another you need people but to be honest we know this like it or not community is messy um, one way in the scripture to describe fellowship is a table we just did it right the Lord's Supper is the table of the Lord and it represents community, and, it, and we share that together. In the Old Testament and New Testament, if, if you really wanted community, you would eat with them. And so if you want your table to be uh, extremely neat, eat alone. But if you get other people there, it becomes messy. That there's crumbs all over the place. And I vacuum this building, and I see, I call one of the rooms downstairs, I call it, uh, the Gerbil room because there's crumbs everywhere and I'm not cracking on that man make those crumbs that means people are in there and the coffee stains on this carpet I love to see those coffee stains <laughs> some of you complain about it I'm saying man there's people in here if no one ever used this thing it would be clean all the time but if you invite people around your table it's going to get messy and so I've said this before, marriage is one sinner married to another sinner, and they produce sinnerlings. <laughs> and I love my boys, but Jason and Jeremy, they both have problems. You know what? Mom and dad's got problems too. My, my, my family's got problems. And it's because we're together. I'm a sinner, Julie's a sinner, Jason's a sinner, Jer Jeremy's a sinner. You put all those sinners together, you got a mess. Right? What is the church? You guys. That's who I'm talking about. Right? What are you guys? Look at the diversity in this room. We got black people, we got white people, we got Spanish people. Some of you I don't know what you are. Right? You know, Jason came off an Indian reservation. You know, he says, I'm not African-American. I'm a Carib. He's right. He is, you know. We've got all this diversity. Some of you are Republicans. Some of you are Democrats. God help us. Right? I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a church like that. I want to be a, church, a part of a church. I don't want this all white church stuff. You know, I don't want all this all black church stuff either. I think God has called us to community with all this mess. And when it's time to vote for a president, we get really messy. Right? Thank God for his grace. 
that we can get through that and remember who we are. Remember where our home is, and it's not the United States. That we need to, and you know, your admission to this congregation, you know, have to, you, have, you know what you have to admit? I'm a mess and I need Jesus. And every one of you fit into that category. You are a mess and you need Jesus. And if I understand that, that should help me to deal with your mess because I have that same problem. I'm a mess and I need Jesus. But in America, if things don't go my way, you know what we do? We walk out. People walk out of their marriages because it's a mess. People walk out on their friends because it's a mess. People leave the church and go someplace else because they're not doing what they want, I want them to do. You know what happens. And so messy people, if you want to have fellowship, you're going to have to put up with the crumbs around the table. It's going to be messy at times. And so uh, another illustration of how we, we miss it, uh, maybe you guys heard, have heard about this. This couple, very well-known couple, Channing and Jenna Tatum, uh, they just recently split up, I understand. But this is the thing that kind of got to me was what they said. Love is a beautiful adventure that has taken us on different paths for now. Absolutely nothing has changed about how we love each other. What does that mean? <laughs> I love her, she loves me, but we're, I'm going this way, she's going that way. That doesn't make any sense at all. But yet that's what society says. Well, we love one another, we just can't stand one another, right? <laughs> and, and so I'm out of here. And that happens in marriages, it happens in churches, it happens among friends. You've become a bigger mess than I want to deal with. And because you're a bigger mess than I want to deal with, I'm gone. Don't tell me it doesn't happen. It does happen. And so culture is trying to program us into this kind of nonsense. It's, it's just nonsense. It's not scripture at all. This is what scripture says about it. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. Oh, that's powerful. You know what Jesus has done? Jesus had invited you to his table. He says, I got a chair for you. Come up and let's eat. The Waterbury Church needs to be like that. Amen? Amen. That we can invite people in who are a mess and say, look, we got a place for you here. We want you to come up and eat with us. And Jesus does that to us. But you can be with people, but not really for people. And here's another basketball illustration. Maurice Harkless plays for the Portland Trailblazers. He's nicknamed Mo. And earlier this season, um, he got into a shooting slump. You know, in NBA, it's, it's about points, right? Winning. And so coaches have to make that hard decision while you're not doing your job. So he benched him. And this guy watched a video of the day he was benched. And he wasn't even allowed on the court for the whole game. And he was sitting there, and, and there was points where his teammates are up cheering whenever a teammate scored. And he's sitting on the bench with his arms folded, sulking like a little child. And he saw a video of himself. And he says, man, I'm acting like a child because I'm not playing today. <laughs> and so after this, he asked the coach if he could speak to the team. And he said, I apologize for being with you but not being for you. Amen. And after that, they went on a 13-game winning streak. And they contribute this man's attitude being a factor in their success. So you could be with somebody, but not for them. And so community, like it or not, takes commitment. You've got to want to be here. You've got to want to be a part of the family. And by having that attitude, it can make a world of difference. A couple of weeks ago, Donnie did this lesson on sexual purity. You know what the Bible says that sex is between a man and a woman in marriage. 
That's what the Bible says, period. All right? There's no other options. That's what the Bible says. It's between a man and a woman in marriage. And I came across a study done at the University of Virginia. And, and psychologists were trying to register commitment in the brain and how the brain would register commitment. And they came up with this crazy uh, research project. And they got some women to volunteer for it. And, um, and they were told, you're going to sit in a chair and you're going to receive an electric ch shock in your ankle. And it's going to be uncomfortable, but as you wait for that shock to occur, this, this shock, um, you can hold the hand of your partner or a stranger. And so they know there's going to be some kind of shock that's going to hit their, hit their body, and so you can hold somebody's hand. Have you ever been in a dentist's office and, and the assistant reaches out and touches you? They're trying to comfort you, right? <laughs> and you know you're about ready to get a shot. <laughs> and so they, the, the, the assistant will reach out and maybe put their arm on you just to comfort you. That's kind of the idea here. And so they're trying to measure, uh, you know, this thing of uh, commitment. And so they came up with this thing. And, and so it, they found that the women who were married held the hands of their husband. And they registered relatively calm in their hypothalamus, you know, that they were able to handle it better because somebody who loved them was right there. The interesting thing about this study is that some of the women were cohabitating. They had a partner, but they weren't married to them. And those who were living with someone but not married to them registered great distress. And the researchers thought that was wild. They weren't expecting that. That the married people, that during this time of distress, because they had this commitment with one another, it had a calming effect with them. But the people who even said, look, I love this person, down deep in their heart, even the researchers said they were committed to their, they said they were committed to their par partner, but in the deepest part of their brain, they realized they were not. And because of that, they, they had more stress. I just thought it was a cool study. That if you are, it, you could be with somebody but not for them kind of thing. But if you're deeply committed to somebody, it can help you. Look, if you're deeply committed to this church, it can bless your life. It can bless your life. It can take away. You're going to get hit with storms. But if you're deeply committed to God and to people, you can survive the storms much better. Peter will say it like this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. That's a great verse. It's saying that this person with you is a mess, but because of my love, it's going to cover up all that mess, right? It covers a multitude of sins. I want to end with one more illustration. David Robinson was probably the greatest player in my mind that played for the San Antonio Spurs. And who's with him there, guys? Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal's what, like 7-1? David Robinson's right there at his eyebrow, right? Big, two big men, right? But that's not the big thing about David Robinson. The, David Robinson's a Christian. Uh, you've heard of Max Lucado. A lot of you have. Max Lucado preaches in San Antonio. Uh, I heard... Max Lucado at the Ganderbrook Men's Retreat a number of years ago. Heard, heard him speak personally. He's a member of the Church of Christ. David Robinson attends the church where Max Lucado preaches. And, and a cool thing, Max Lucado tells his story. After being married a number of years, they had three children. Their children were small, but, and David was still playing in the NBA. And he said, look, I want to renew our vows. And he, because they could, let's go to Hawaii and do it. And so they had this time in Hawaii, and they asked Max Lucado and his wife to go and be a part of the ceremony. And so Max Lucado says that they, they renewed the vows, and then after the vows, this is what David Robinson did. He got down on his knees. He's a massive fella, right? He got down on his knees on the beach, and he looked his children in the eye and this is what he said I want you to know you will always have a daddy 
and your daddy will always love your mommy. But don't worry, when you come home, daddy and mommy will always be together. Now, <clears throat> do you think ki those kids will ever forget that? Uh, in Hawaii, right? <laughs> Hawaii's a cool place. In fact, if any of you want to renew your vows, <laughs> and you want a preacher and his wife to go, Julie and I are in, <laughs> right? Because we're into love, right? <laughs> And so, but it's more than that. Isn't it cool that David Robinson did that to his kids? He says, you, we'll always be together. Don't question my love for your mom or your, her love for me. When you come home, we're here. You know what? That's the kind of love that Jesus had for us. His name's Emmanuel, God with us. You know what God says? I'm here. I'm here for you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. Isn't that scripture? God promises that. Community that we need is created when you can say to somebody, in the face of uncertain future, you can count one thing to be predictable. I will be here. And do, will the Waterbury Church be blessed if we have that kind of people? Will your marriage be blessed if you're that kind of person? Will your kids be blessed if you will say to them, I will be here? There's an article I came across dealing with David Robinson. And after he retired, he said, my number one priority when I retired was to be home. Just to spend as much time with my boys as possible. I'm just figuring out how to be a dad and being a husband. So it's a good challenge and I'm learning a lot. But it goes on to say, Robinson and then his wife Valerie helped to establish a Culver Academy in San Antonio and it's for underprivileged children. And they spend a lot of their uh, extra time now dedicating themselves to this work in downtown San Antonio. They now have more than ever a school, uh, in school operations and funding envir environment uh, where they are expecting 120 kids to be a part of this program, which is awesome. But not added to that, it says Robinson, a man of faith, humbly claims that the only thing he does at Oak Hills is to lead a weekly Bible study that draws a crowd of two, over 200 men every week. So this man after he retired, retired from the MBA, is actively involved in a Church of Christ in San Antonio, teaching an adult class every Sunday. I think it's great. He's committed. He's committed to God. He's committed to his kids. The Waterbury Church needs more men like that. Amen? Amen. We need that. One story and then we're done. I'm going to release you early. I came across this thing about this guy who developed the first mechanical heart. His name was Michael DeBarkey. And I guess a little girl in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, seven years old, needed a heart plant transplant. And so the doctor went in, told the little girl, look, I'm gonna, we're going to have to take your heart out. We're going to give you this new plastic heart so you can live. And the little girl thought about it, and as a seven-year-old, she was trying to wrap her mind around having a plastic heart. And so she asked the doctor, will it have any love in it? <clears throat> and the doctor said, hundreds of people have worked night and day to build this heart because they want you to live. I'm going to give you a heart that's full of love. So God wants to give you a new heart. Not the old heart. The old heart is conditional. I'll love you if you do this, if you do that. God wants to give you an agape heart. That I love you unconditionally, messy and all. If you don't have that, you can. But you and I, we need to keep on loving one another, like it or not. Let's stand and sing. <clears throat>